But now um, let's go back to uh, stage two. Today we will talk about how we can save the human brain. Actually, there are 47 million people living with dementia worldwide with a new case discovered every three seconds. And this, of course, is one of our biggest global healthcare challenges uh, we face today. And uh, we will wa we want to talk about this topic in the next hour um, to see how we can share ideas uh, and knowledges and innovative technology and big data to help advanced research through uh, mobile gameplay. And I would like to introduce you to Emma Barnett from the BBC for the next talk. Great. Hello. <clears throat> Welcome to this panel. Can you hear me OK? We're all good. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I am Emma. Thank you very much for having me right here in Berlin. And today, we've asked you to join with us, the hashtags behind you, uh, to talk about Game for Good, which is an initiative launched today here at Republica. It was come up with uh, by Deutsche Telekom. We'll hear more about how it was uh, thought up in the first place in a moment with the intention of trying to use games for good, specifically with healthcare, and specifically today, we're talking about a game that helps or hopes to help and certainly looks like it will help with research to do with the diagnoses of dementia, dementia and how people use a game and how that can help people with their research. It's going to be a really interesting thing to hear more about in the detail of in a moment. So um, in cooperation with scientific partners, I'm happy to say many British people have been involved with this. University of College of London, University of East Anglia, Glitches, who we'll be hearing from in a moment, the co-founder of that, are games developers, to come together with Deutsche Telekom and, of course, Alzheimer's Research to create this game, which is called Sea Hero Quest. Um, and the approach is very, very simple. It's essentially based on a series of mazes. You'll have the chance, if not already, to have a play with it. And when you play, you are doing something very, very good, which will be explained more about in just a moment. But what is Sea Hero Quest about? Let's find out. We have a film, which I'm hoping will go live now. Or now. <laughs> to my right. <laughs> I thought you disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever survived dementia. There are no treatments that tackle the disease itself. We need to understand more about the condition. We need to understand how we can treat this disease. We know that research holds the key, and for the research to be able to take place, we need data which doesn't exist. So scientists' lack of data is slowing down research. We thought that maybe we could look at this problem from a different angle. One of the first signs of dementia is that people start losing their ability to find their way around. What makes this project really unique is the combination of cutting edge science combined with a games design company to reach out to hundreds of thousands of people in an experiment that we couldn't do in a lab. The game is split up into five different themed areas. You're a sea explorer and you're recovering memories for your father. You're going on the journey that he went on and you're doing it in his boat. And as you move around, your position gets relayed back to the scientists and they can see it like a heat map. And that data is used to try and understand on a mass scale how people are navigating around these different mazes. But actually all that data, every little movement they make, every choice they make in that game, it's going to help our research. And the more we can find out about how people find their way around, the better we can understand the problems people might get in dementia. It's a total reinvention of the way this kind of research data is collected, stored and accessed. It's not just engaging, it's also scientifically valid and above all, secure. If we can get hundreds of thousands of people to share their time and participate, we can answer questions we could never have dreamed of answering before. By playing this game, they're helping being part of the solution. They're helping us be that little bit nearer to finding those treatments and understanding how we can better diagnose dementia. I mean, I should also say I was very interested to do this today because 
my friend's mum has Alzheimer's, but she got it when she was 55. And I think it's one of those things that people think of only, often they only think of it as affecting older people, but it can affect people from a much younger age. So diagnosis and early diagnosis is very, very key. Well, could you please put your hands together to join me for now on the stage, the guests for this panel who are going to tell us more about how this came about and how we can all help Game for Good. Great, thank you. So let me just do a very brief introduction straight away here. I have Max Scott Slade, who is the game designer of this, co-founder of Glitches, a game studio in East London, if I have to say, I know where that is. Uh, so we also have Wolfgang Kompar Boltold, who's the, the idea for the initiative, vice president of international marketing comms for Deutsche Telekom. I have Sarah Cornish just here, who's coming from New York, who works for Games for Change as a project director and also done a lot of time in the United Nations and an interesting project there, which I'm sure we'll hear a bit about from some of your experience. And a man who doesn't really need much introduction, I'm sure you saw him already, he told me in a much bigger hall than this, uh, <laughs> I should say Dr. Gunter Duke, also known as a wild duck or a wizard. Please put your hands again, thank you. <laughs> Wolfgang, can I start with you? Sure, okay. So this idea for the initiative, um, I should remind you, we have some traveling mics. Um, tell me how you first came up with this. Well, maybe uh, it would be helpful for you guys to first understand just a little bit uh, of our brand, Deutsche Telekom, because uh, after all, we do marketing and uh, we try to position our brand uh, in a particular way. And um, we regard ourselves to be and want to become uh, a brand that is actually the sharing brand. So life is for sharing and all what we do is trying to foster that thought. And uh, with the help of our products and services, we enable people to share, to share whatever is relevant to them. And if you just have that thought sink in for one second, what is it actually what people share? Uh, what people share is their memories. And memories is not just stuff that is uh, relating back to 10 years ago or so. It's also a memory uh, that's maybe uh, just one minute old or just what happened outside uh, a couple of seconds before. And if you then consider that without these memories, there would be no sharing. For us, there seems to be a natural task to step in because we want to safeguard um, memories of people in order for them to be still able to share these memories. And that's why for us it was uh, almost a natural task uh, to embark on that journey and uh, to start an ideation phase on, um, on this project, which we call uh, Game for Good. And Game for Good, I mean, this is what, when you, it makes sense why you thought about memories, which then led you to think about Alzheimer's and how people could potentially use games in that way. But what what for you are you trying to send out as a message about this game? What do you want people to know about it before they play it? Well, for us, this is um, a stage where we want to engage you guys. Yeah? Uh, sharing has also a connotation of participation. And that means that all of you, hopefully, after this session, after this panel, start sharing this news about the launch of the good game. And... Um, what I would like you to take home is download the game and share as much as you can. Contribute two minutes or more of uh, your life to trying to defeat dementia and try to find uh, a first yeah, attempt to really tackle this, this okay. disease. Max, let me bring you in here. So you, you had the task of designing a game, no small feat, that would potentially lead to uh, creating a better route for diagnosis, early diagnosis for dementia. How did you go about that? How do you even start thinking about that design? It was, um, it was a really interesting uh, process for us because usually when we're building games, you, the objective is to build something which is you know, a fairly addictive experience that, that people want to keep coming back to and playing. Um, the remit of that is usually just you know the platform that you're on or how many players you've got or the characters you've got involved. But here we have um, 
this science data and this navigational data, which is essential. And the, the way that this affected us designing the game was huge. Um, it, it, was, it was a restriction um, to how we were designing the game, but it was also um, a, a really big challenge, but super interesting one, you know. And so, just for so people understand, when they're having a good time playing this game, what are they actually contributing to? We can, uh, in a moment, I'll introduce uh, people far wiser than us on, on the science of Alzheimer's, but just in terms of the game, what are they actually achieving? So, um, as you play the game, you are a boat and you are sailing around these, uh, these kind of mazes in these themed areas. The first theme is uh, the Arctic. Uh, and, and the way that this information gets translated into uh, data is every 500 milliseconds, it's tagging your location, your orientation, what you see on the screen. Um, and it, this data is actually really, really helpful for the scientists who help design the levels with us uh, to try and understand how humans navigate. Okay, so just staying on that point, I'm going to bring in, I hope he's there, has he got a microphone near him? Dr. Michael Hornberger, who's a professor of dementia research at the University of East Anglia who works on this. Hello, have you got a mic? You do have a mic. Yes. Um, could, you, could you explain, if you don't mind, about when you were working together, what, what is this actually going to feed into in terms of research to help people who may be thinking they're going towards having dementia or already have it? So um, what we see very often in the patients in the clinic that people are getting lost and what we try to establish with this game is really to see what is normal in terms of navigation. How do normal people navigate? How do normal people get lost? Because we don't know this at the moment. So we realized that using gaming and crowdsourcing could be a fantastic way of creating a getting a huge database of healthy people navigating from which then we can use for, for our dementia research to diagnose people better. And, and is, is one of the issues that we can't diagnose people earlier? Yes, part of it is diagnosing earlier, but also diagnosing more specifically because a lot of dementia research is based on diagnosis based on memories and how you retrieve memories, but everybody knows that memory gets worse with aging in general. But right. what we see is usually that people getting lost is a much more specific sign for dementia, and particularly Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so this is very linked to how we navigate because one of the earliest ways that Alzheimer's, you can see, starts to affect somebody is they get lost and they can't find their way home. Okay, do you mind passing the mic along to, to Sarah? Sarah, you've had a look at this. You've obviously got experience, very much, a lot of experience in gaming for good. Um, I know you don't like the word gamification. We discussed this before we came on. Um, tell, me, tell me what you make of it and, and how it kind of feeds into what you're seeing in this area. Sure. Um, so I come from, I'm from New York City, and uh, I work at a, an organization called Games for Change that was founded in 2004, and we're the leading organization that promotes games for social impact and for health. And so we've sort of seen this, this emerging sector of games for health and games for scientific research develop over the last decade. And, uh, and Sea Hero Quest falls into that category and, um, and is really breaking new ground when it comes to scientists and researchers collaborating with the game design community to create something that can have a real lasting impact, but also be a fun game. And so I have played Sea Hero Quest. I recommend it. Um, <laughs> it was more fun than I expected because um, often, well done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> often playing a game where you go in knowing, I did, I did have a little bit of background on the game, so I knew that it was about, you know, research about dementia and that it would, um, there was a the intersection of big data and gaming and all of these things. Um, but the game itself is, is quite fun. Um, it's, a, it's a runner, kind of runner type game. Um, and you advance through levels and the levels definitely get more challenging. Um, it, it recalled some, um, it recalled getting lost, you know, absolutely, when you reach certain, uh, certain levels. And um, I think in terms of the way it fits into sort of the canon of Games for Health, um, it's both a really good sort of awareness tool, you know, as you're playing and you're experiencing that feeling of maybe disorientation or those first kind of stages of realizing that you kind of lost your way um, in, the, in the maze that Max was referring to, um, it, you start to realize like, oh, maybe this is sort of what it feels like to experience those first signs of dementia. Um, and so I think that the awareness piece of the game is really strong. And then um, it's also an example of a game that sort of augments 
a scientific research program. Um, we've seen some examples of like that, um, of games like that, uh, such as Fold It, which is a sort of citizen science game um, that was developed years ago by researchers um, looking for uh, proteins having to do with HIV and AIDS. Um, and I think this is a great example of a game that, um, that supports a research program in a really strong way. And, and so. if, you, if you didn't know it was a game for good, but it was mm -hmm. doing something that contributed to scientific research, would your view of it, do you think, be different? I mean, because you say that, you're thinking, oh, this is how you might feel at the beginning of losing your way if you had something like Alzheimer's going on in your brain. I mean, yeah. how much of that is now you know that versus just playing it? No, I think it's a good question. And um, I was having a conversation last night with um, Max and Michael, and, um, and we were talking about the, the importance of a game first being really fun and engaging um, and compelling players to keep going and keep playing. Um, and so, you know, that, that idea of being challenged and having really um, fun mechanics, but then the fact that it, is, it does have this kind of higher meaning um, and you're contributing to this really important cause that most people have a personal connection to, um, I think we're, we're going to be able to kind of see multiple audiences come into this game and play it. So people who are already casual gamers um, would be kind of engaged in the, in the gameplay and then uh, audiences <laughs> interested in the dementia aspect of it and the research aspect of it and contributing to that cause okay. as well. Gunter, hello. Let me bring you in. Um, when you see something like this come out onto the market, uh, I mean, it's really launched for free, are we at the beginning of this process, would you say, in terms of games being used properly by the scientific community for health? Where do you think we are with this? Yeah, it, it, it's a brilliant idea, so, so that's why I'm here yes. in the discussion. Uh, you, scientifically, uh, the problem is that we get a lot of data, and uh, you, you can have some diagnosis. Maybe you have to revise the game because maybe at some corner the irregularity of some guys is better understandable than in other places. Then you have to rearrange. Maybe you have to recall the game then after some months and then next <coughs> version then you get it better. And then you get a science tool where, where you have a good diagnosis. Maybe the dream could be to have kinds of... Uh, signs of therapy in, in the end that, uh, that you, you, you teach people how to navigate in yeah. the end and improve the game. This is the second stage, so, so you can w have a lot of work for many years. So for me, it's not really interested of if the game is fun or not. So maybe for you, you are not normal. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you navigate in a different way because you are authentic... Uh, uh, hardcore players or something, you, you see, maybe you see it differently. It's also not your task to, to spend two minutes for, for playing the game. Your task is to Twitter the game, to tweet the game, uh, and find a lot, lot, lot of normal people participate in two minutes. And, and uh, I think the fun is, uh, he, he, these, these two are the really proud people to have a fun game. That, that's not a problem, it's a duty. to. To 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 spare uh, to spare two two minutes for for and, for and do, you, do you think people are more comfortable now with the sharing of their data because a lot of people have I mean obviously it's anonymized it's not something in that sense but people if you say to them just play this game they feel very good about it but if you start saying to them we're going to be doing this and it's going to be used for this and we're doing that I mean do you think we've got a lot more comfortable with that. Okay, it's not, not a hard thing to just to install the game, play a few minutes and... No, but it's the psychology of, it. of using different devices to get into research, to get people to do research. Usually, if you think, I think of medical research, I think of going into a lab and being present and, and providing my you know, information in whatever way they want it. But this is a, this is a very different relationship that we're yeah. starting mm -hmm. through data. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the whole pro uh, the, in, in e-health or in medicine, the, you have a big, big problem. So, so most of the research is done for uh, some special illnesses. And uh, if you if you make a doctoral thesis at a un uh, at a university cl at clinical uh, environment, you find in those rare uh, illnesses maybe five patients or ten. And then they look for five or ten people, interview them, two are already dead, 
which is statistically a catastrophe because you cannot say anything about that. And, and then you make a doctoral thesis with the statistics of two or ten people. And this is the reason that most studies have anti-studies. So one study says, yes, sugar makes you dead. And they say, sugar is fine for you. So, and you have millions of studies ma made by, by maybe 10 or 20 patients. And it would be a great, great thing to just have a cloud of all these data worldwide that you can make statistics of maybe 2,000 or 10,000 having a, a rare illness. And this, with, with the game you have, you, this opens the door of many more possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, it, 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 you cannot you cannot find against every disease in in, in this uh, surrounding, but but this is a good approach to to uh, for science to go for the goal. I, I, the problem is always with the with the with the data. So I, I, I worked for IBM, so of course uh, I was the guy who made the da big data business. And I, I always said, people, we, we save your lives, and please give the data. It, yeah. it, 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 it's, it's not that you, we open your in-box in for mails or something like that. And, and, and it's a different way of thinking you, about you, it. We, ha we have to be a little bit accustomed to giving our health data to, to, to the public or to the cloud because uh, it's really for the good. And, and uh, uh, the, 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 the discipline of e-health needs a lot of data. Okay. So, so, for instance, most of the diabetes uh, patients will be soon connected to the internet and they will automatically treat mm. it by the internet from the cloud so in, in your stomach yeah. with and and uh, this saves a lot of lives i think it, it, uh, only in germany 24000 people die on di on direct diabetes every year 24000 it's uh, 10 times more than in traffic or so and, yeah. and and of course you have to give the data in this case yeah okay and, and on that point max you're getting more work to do here. You might have to go back and do a new version of the game, think of different ways of doing it. I mean, some of the criticism around, uh, I mean, admittedly, we were talking about this has only been possible recently that maybe you can game for this kind of good. But some of the things is you have to be really careful, I'm sure, when you're creating this, that you don't drive the user in a certain way. So they have to drive the game. Yeah. I mean, how difficult is that to design with that kind of psychology? <coughs> Uh, th this is kind of what I was talking a little bit about before, touching on at least. Um, you know, we can't use things like coins or uh, in, in the game to direct players around because that's having an impact on, on their navigation or thought process. In actual fact, we're, we can't have shadows. We can't have the sea moving in a particular direction. We can't have so many things that you would usually just assume you could do or would make the game look better. Um, we couldn't do. So with this in mind, uh, we, we really tried to come up with ways that were sort of like meta-game type elements, you know, your three stars, your boat customization, um, that would allow the game to still be fun and engaging, um, but still make sure that we were collecting the data. Because if people stop playing after the first few levels, you what use is the game, you know? We need to get people playing for a long period of time. And for you, what are like, if you've said what you can't do, so then yeah. what are like the core ingredients for people who are thinking about, I'd like to code something which was a game for some sort of good? Obviously, this was very specific. Yeah. But have you got any things that you've learned from doing it now that you could share? I think that the, the collaboration with the scientists was super important. Having existing medical studies that were out there um, that had been used by uh, people to understand about human navigation already. Um, these were really helpful. So Hugo Spears had done some navigational research and built a crude game, his words, not mine, um, about navigating. And we used uh, some of the thought behind that in the game. Um, Michael was doing these experiments with dementia patients um, in supermarkets about them pointing back to the original location where they entered the supermarket. Okay. There is a version of this in the game. Um, and these things exist to really validate the data we're creating from the game as well. You know, it's not just a tool that collects navigational data about players. It has real world science in there that validates that data too. 
So that's what's gone into it. Wolfgang, when, when it starts coming in, the data, how is it going to work in terms of working with researchers, science, I mean, and, and what's going to be the involvement of Deutsche in that? Well, let me maybe first correct uh, a potential misinterpretation. Um, um, Professor Duke, you mentioned that uh, this is anonymized data. In fact, it is not. The data is anonymous, so we don't know anything about uh, the gamers as such. What, what we know is basically some figures about where in those maces mm -hmm. they navigate in which fashion. Um, also, where, where we come into play uh, as far as data security is concerned uh, is obviously that all of um, the background, be it uh, servers but also transmission, is on uh, secure uh, data networks of Deutsche Telekom. And uh, we do really um, pay utmost attention to that fact because um, we have given ourselves um, a obligation that, in fact, uh, there's also something we call uh, digital responsibility, and that is one side of this. Yeah? Digital responsibility for us also means, amongst other aspects, that um, the data that is being gathered uh, within this game is actually safeguarded, and that there's uh, no fraud in, with, in, 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 in whatsoever regard possible with this data. And um, I think that is essential because we want really people to contribute. And um, as I said, please download the game, please share it. And um, for us, we have a chance for the first time to really create the world's first and global benchmark for when actually dementia is starting to allow us to try to tackle this disease at an earlier stage, as you said. Yeah? Or um, to try to find medications and figure out whether which one works and such things. So for us, it's a, a, a very encompassing project and, and not just linked um, to, to any, any data question. Yeah? And for you, what, do you, how do you see this going forward? You've launched it today. It's been a year in the creation. What do you see as the next steps? Uh, well, safeguarding sharing as such is nothing that uh, happens uh, overnight and it will stay, if not forever, but for a long time. Mm -hmm. But the, the goal is to gather enough uh, data so that uh, scientists can actually come up with a meaningful analysis. And um, I think in this movie you saw a very tiny snippet uh, where there was a heat map shown, mm -hmm. uh, where you can uh, literally see where uh, navigation is supposed to be normal or where you are deviating from that normal navigational skill. And uh, once that is sufficient, I think the focus from gathering that data is going to shift to analyzing that data. And um, this is something where we hope that on the far end um, we will be able to even deliver uh, some diagnosis tools so when you guys go to the doctor or we um, and maybe have this um, thought or this uh, suspect that uh, I don't know because of me not finding my way around here in Berlin and missing up streets uh, that I might already be suffering from yeah. uh, dementia and so it would be lovely if in five or ten years from now there would be a simple diagnosis tool where I could do a test like I do a test for my eyes or for my ears uh, indicating, well, you guys should be uh, in, a, in, a, in a more a deeper investigation about this matter. S sorry, let me bring you back in. When you, um, when you look at kind of the trends across healthcare specifically with what people are doing with games, you mentioned a, a, an example there, um, was it called, was it Fold? Fold? Fold folded. Folded, yeah. okay, I need to check that out. And for you, when you look at this stuff, do you think it's doing as much as it could yet? I mean, do you, do you have an idea of where, where the boundaries are at the moment and where they could be? Because I think we're sort of still at the beginning, aren't we? Yeah, that's a great question. It's an exciting place to be, definitely. And I think, you know, continuing to break new ground is really important, like this project is doing um, with bringing sort of cross-sector partners together um, on a project like this, where you need the experienced researchers, you need the, the problem that demands solving, you need the 
good game designers. Um, and then, of course, you need you know lots and lots of players. And there are some great examples out there of games that are um, are sort of operating at that intersection of uh, treating big data as a public good and um, and conducting research or understanding different you know human behavior. Um, have, how many of you wear wearable technologies that help kind of measure your daily steps or your fitness or even track track what you're eating? So a few people. Um, so there was a game developed called Zombies Run that some of you wearing those devices might have played. Um, and this game was, um, was developed to help motivate people to exercise more. And it connected with the wearables um, to, uh, to kind of take in some of that data and, uh, and encourage you to compete with other people wearing those fitness trackers. Um, and it ended up collecting data from millions of people. Over two, two million players um, played this game. And so, um, so behavioral psychologists and scientists were able to um, understand patterns of exercise and obesity. And, um, and so that an example of a game for health that, um, that also engaged lots and lots of people. And so um, there's a game called Remission that was developed uh, to, uh, for, to do cancer research and for cancer patients to actually play uh, that motivated them to um, comply with their treatments. Um, and so it's a, it's a first person shooter game where you travel through Healthy. A, a sick body. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you travel through a sick body and you actually shoot cancer cells. And so um, in the process of playing this game, patients would learn about their disease <coughs> and it would sort of motivate them to, to fight um, and to take their therapies. And so we've seen a lot of examples okay. of different types of games um, in this Games for Health space. And I think um, something that we're very excited about is emerging technologies um, like biofeedback tools and virtual reality we're hearing a lot about um, here at Republica and the potential of these tools to help researchers and game designers work together and develop new approaches. And are you research. seeing it mainly from the private sector or like are governments very involved? Now obviously you've had your experience at the United Nations. I know you mm -hmm. operated a bit about like a tech startup within that. Um, but do you, think, do you think it's mainly private sector who are putting the money towards this at the moment? That's, a, that's another good question. Thank um, you, I'm in the business of questions. <laughs> You're on a roll. <laughs> Um, and, that, and that's something that Games for Change is really advocating for, is more funding and investment into this space, especially this intersection of research and design. Um, there is some private sector support. I think that's something about this particular project that is so unique, is the partnership between uh, Deutsche Telekom and, um, and the researchers and the game design um, and glitchers. But um, we see a lot of work in the independent game design community, um, researchers coming together with scientists and designers to, uh, to create new tools, to use new technologies. Um, there's more and more support coming from the pharmaceutical industry um, to support new research approaches uh, using games and kind of these novel engagement methods. Um, but I think for the most part, it's still sort of a bottom-up um, bottom sector or industry. Okay. But we're really pushing for it to be, you know, to get more major players involved, to get more resources um, being allocated toward this type of research. And are there particular countries that are leading in this space? Have you noticed a trend in, in various parts? Yeah, um, to be, uh, not, to, not to toot the horn of the United States, but, yeah, New York. Um, you are in Europe, I'm we, just reminding uh, you. Uh, yes, no, um, <laughs> there's, there's some very exciting research coming out of Scandinavia. Um, Finland has a lot of uh, game companies. Um, and then, of course, yeah, the, re the rest of Europe, there's some exciting, um, exciting projects. But I think um, the gaming industry in the U.S. is, is enormous. It's a, over an $80 billion industry. It's bigger than the music and the film industries combined in, in the States. Um, and I think that, that influence is sort of driving a lot of the, um, the game projects and the funding. Um, <coughs> and and we're, we're trying to kind of advocate for the gaming industry to... Um, to put more kind of research into these types of research and funding and, and support these types of projects. So I, 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 do, I think that it's sort of being driven a little bit by the, the major players. Um, and then, of course, we're seeing um, in Asia the rise of esports and kind of these other applications of games. I should say, I'm, we'll be giving you the opportunity yeah. soon to ask questions, to <laughs> so get thinking of them now, and we'll have microphones coming around. Um, Gunter, let me bring you back in. When you zooming out away from this game specifically for a moment, with your experience, with your many hats on, whether it's writing or working for IBM or whatever you've been doing, being a wild duck, as that is the name uh, that you seem to go by as well, do you, do you think um, 
What do you think about big data and healthcare working together in the sense of, have you seen, it, it, have we made a lot, enough progress with that yet? What's your view on where we're up to? Uh, you, you, of course, many people have problems with giving their data. Uh, then is uh, a <coughs> lot of mistrust maybe in lots of industries. So, so uh, I'm becoming more ill every year because the, uh, the, the cap of the value is maybe of some, some uh, numbers in myself is cutting down, 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 and uh, uh, maybe in, in, in my age then 70% uh, of have diabetes or something or cholesterol, cholesterol problems and so. And we, we fear, of course, kind of pharmaceutical industries and all kinds of industries selling something and I'm more interested as a researcher in this, this okay. game and uh, this is pure research and we, we, we have to know the data and to, 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 we, have to, we have to know wh whom to help and whom to be afraid of. Yes. Of course this is always the problem with the data. And uh, you, you can do a lot of medicine. I said uh, that, that uh, all the, uh, uh, the clinics, they have some, some rare patients of the rare diseases. And if they would share all the patient data, then that would be a wealth of research. And uh, by combining uh, this, this knowledge by games, this is one possibility to do that. And in this, uh, in this case, I, I would say everyone donates instead of blood two minutes gaming and that's okay. So, so I, I don't see... Yeah, but some see, people would have I, a real I, problem I, with that. <laughs> no, seriously, some people would have a real problem with that. Blood yeah. feels like something you're giving that's real. People haven't necessarily made the jump to, if I play a game, I am helping scientific research. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think can be done to communicate that better? Maybe you, you have to maybe uh, initiate a campaign which is a, a, a higher level. So this is, this is a, a valid lighthouse project that, that in, in some case you can see that research c can help. Uh, and maybe you have uh, in the end idea for, uh, ideas for a therapy, not only a diagnosis that you can teach people to, to behave better. So, so it, it's, not a, it's, it's not a real value that I know. Maybe I, mm -hmm. I, I get a dementia in 10 years and uh, by uh, playing the game, you tell me in 10 years I will have dementia and I'm, I do not love the diagnosis at this time. So, so it doesn't help me, so uh, when you should have also a therapy in the end. And uh, I, I think it, it, this, is, this is a lighthouse project in a much, <coughs> in much more uh, bigger a frame, framework. That. But that and, would, and that would we, imply, sorry, just to bring you back in, that we, so need, we need governments, though, don't we, to communicate yeah. at this level? Yeah. I mean, yeah, so it, it, no, the problem, is in all, the problem is in participation. So if you have such a lighthouse project, you have the problem to, to get 100,000 people giving the data, say, so this is the request. So he, we are here maybe 200 or 300, this is not enough. If you tweet it, uh, then maybe we get two, two or 3,000. We are still left with 97,000. And uh, we should have the goal, say, from this 100,000, we, we, we donate uh, 20,000 in Germany, say, and the rest in, in the US or somewhere else mm -hmm. where, where you are traveling around. And, and always we have this problem of, of participation, participation, participation. So, and and uh, uh, there should be a yeah, kind of government help to, to promote these things and say, please do and that. Get and, and meanwhile, mm -hmm. we have three billion people playing casual games around the world. And so I think that's, that's, that's such a key to this project is if the game is engaging and fun and compelling, <coughs> people, people will play it. And, um, and they, don't, you know, they don't necessarily need to, the public doesn't necessarily need to see a really impactful you know, research report come out of it yet. And I think I think to have you know a hundred thousand people, the goal of this of this project initially, to start playing it, we start to see results, and then the science will will become clear. Um, yeah, the, the ideal would be that the game is so fine 
that, yes, that you get millions of users <laughs> just because it's so much fun. And, uh, and uh, of it course, will spread. Yeah, yeah of course, no, of course, uh, the the real Dota 2 or the, these games, they, they, they are full companies behind that, and uh, many millions of dollars or billion even, and and there's a whole industry behind uh, just only this one game mm. with all the esports surrounding the tournaments and and uh, the public viewing events and so on so on so on and you cannot we cannot um, really expect that uh, if you start a game for research um, then then it's so much fun that immediately millions well, of Max people Max might have something to say about that in a moment I'll let him but Wolfgang first so so in some sense we 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 we, sh we, uh, we we have to start yeah no, no, hope, I understand. hope that, that it, uh, it, it's enough fun that many people voluntarily go and do that. And then, of course, you have to, to, to uh, say, please donate. Yeah. Let me, that's can a I just, duty let, as a good citizen. Let, let me bring in Wolfgang. Sorry, go on. Just, just a little bit of perspective, uh, because I really love what you say, Gunther. Um, uh, the, the game is going to be available in 17 languages uh, amongst those there will be even mandarin and um, it's going to be heavily pushed uh, via apple and via google on their own behalf so we didn't do anything about it they just love it and basically everybody uh, we speak to and uh, everybody who we show this game loves it so um, that's not saying please don't do anything in fact you should do all you can to help us push this initiative uh, but but uh, we are very uh, positive about the prospects, yeah. and um, um, uh, some of you might, might have been at the press conference earlier on, so the first initial uh, target would be 100,000 mm -hmm. people who contribute two minutes of their life to this initiative, but I hope it's going to be easily uh, above this. Yeah? Well, just before I open out to questions, Max, can I bring you back? It is quite difficult, isn't it, to get people to... If you say to somebody down the pub who's not, not to do with the tech world, oh, I'm just creating a game that might be helping with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's earlier. I mean, I, there's sort of the gap, isn't there, between what you do and then regular people understanding the impact that those games can have. What do you think we can do about that besides government campaigns and making it fun? I think um, it's really important to remember that something like Alzheimer's and dementia and these, these kind of real kind of heavy uh, conditions that people experience, that actually so many people have someone they know that has this problem. And I think people do want to engage with that. I think that the, the casual guy down the pub will get sensitive about a family member who's suffering from this problem. Uh, and, and, and they won't know what to do because in these scenarios, what can you do except watch <coughs> someone deteriorate uh, or try and make their life more comfortable. So I think people do uh, want to do something, mm. but they don't know how to. And I think games are a really good tool for enabling people to do something about it. And are you going to do more of this now? Yeah, I, I really want to do more Is of this. Is this like a new Game for Good yeah. chapter of your <laughs> Absolutely. career? Yeah, for sure. Okay. I, I'd love to be more involved in this type of work because it's, it's really rewarding and also... Um, as Sarah was saying, this is such an interesting place to be. We're at the forefront of something very new, uh, and it's nice to be in the luxurious position of feeling like you're, you're contributing to the, the rules that, that are being written about how to do these kinds of things. And this seems like a successful project. We've gone through and worked with a number of scientists, um, specialists from all around the world, and I think unanimously everyone was very positive about the project. And mm -hmm. it wasn't always easy, but it... It was a very uh, enjoyable experience overall. Yes, but better to be saving people than just collecting coins, I suppose. Exactly. Okay, well, there's nothing wrong with collecting coins. Do we have some microphones uh, or a microphone that can go around the audience? <coughs> yes, I hope we do. We do? Okay, and do we have a question? Because that would also be useful. We have a few questions. Great stuff. Um, so, microphone here. If you could just say what you do or where you're from, that'd be lovely for your question. Um, yeah, I'm Johannes Lauterbach. Um, first of all, great panel, great initiative. I wish you all the success. Um, I'm participating in a uh, cancer study, and um, there I um, have a, a direct incentive that I'm accompanied over years 
um, and get feedback also on my risk level in, in, in getting that. And I'm just uh, asking myself, what is the incentive playing this game other than having fun? Um, is there a possibility also to use the channel up to your cloud, up to generating data um, in both directions so mm. that I get some kind of feedback, some kind of a, a guidance for myself? It's interesting. Is that, is that a possibility, Matt? So it, the game currently has a, uh, a time of how much you've contributed <coughs> towards dementia research. There is an ongoing counter in the game, so you can actually see your impact. Um, at this stage in the project, being the, the launch day, uh, the data that would need to be processed to actually enable us to have some feedback into the app isn't available yet. But I foresee that there will be um, a loop back to the app itself and uh, and that could dictate the next experiments that happen. I mean, right now we need information, we need data. I don't think that once this game comes out, there's no more information going into the app. Is something you should talk about? Um, maybe just to add, um, there, there will be no way uh, for us to be able to link back to you because we don't have your data. Yeah. So um, I don't know whether this tackles your uh, question, but as we are not able to trace back to you, we will never be able to give you specifically on an individual level any feedback uh, about how you did, for example. Yeah? So um, the, the benefit for you as an individual is number one, you're going to have fun, number one. Number two, you, you, you're going to be in um, hopefully a, a good mood contributing to a good cause. Uh, num number three, I think that um, on the long run, y we as a, as a uh, community will be, will be able to deliver uh, aids to help us fight dementia. We don't know how these aids are going to look like. Yeah? And um, talking to the scientists, we are, we are just on this uh, endeavor altogether. We just don't know it. We are trying to get there. And hopefully, as I said earlier, there will be a an early diagnosis tool, for example, to yeah. be able to tackle uh, earlier me, stuff. Yeah? Let, let me add, uh, the, uh, the first 100,000 users are needed to, 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 to make the tool. So, so you have to first to have a study of what the normal being is playing. And then you, you, from the data, you can, you can study what is not normal or has some indication. Then maybe you have to rearrange the, the, the game sometimes because you see at that point, at that point, at that point in, in the game, there, uh, there you can, as a scientist, see the most irregular uh, movements. And then you, you try to have more of these curves in it where you have more information and after that you have even more and more information from the gaming and maybe in in version 5 you have a real diagnosis tool and then maybe you can think about that people get a feedback after but but in the first run i would suspect this is just a donation okay thank you for that let me keen to get a few more questions there's one just here please say who you are where you come from Hi, <clears throat> I'm Volker Kahle, I'm a physics student, and um, maybe you have not told about it, but maybe you know the Open Cognition Project, which has the Luminosity app, <coughs> and it's very huge, and I think they're doing some things seriously wrong, even though they are working together with 40 universities and have over 5 million downloads, um, because I think they see this more as a big market. And now, because you're just starting, you have the opportunity to make this different. So for instance, um, you could make this open source, everything, um, as well as like using all the data in the open science way. Because um, what I see currently is going on, that you have these apps which are working together with universities, but also like the science, uh, uh, let's say the science mechanisms are not always how it should be. Like, for instance, you have big journals, you have um, publication pressure, you have um, like some scientists who are doing studies and studies and studies and 
like uh, Gunther said, there's uh, actually no research at all. And um, f well, this could be like the first opportunity to let the community involve, get involved. So, um, for instance, there's so much data out there in all these apps, and um, I cannot access them. It's a big shame. Okay. Um, I mean, we could do so much more science and. Um, yeah. So, so you, you'd like to know if it could be changed in the way that you have just described to, to allow people to c collaborate more? The open side of it. I, I get the gist of it. Wolfgang, do you want to start? I'm not sure whether, whether I got your question right, um, but, but let me try to give you a couple of slices. Num number one, let me reassure you there's no money involved from our side. That was one of the first remarks you made, so uh, Deutsche Telekom is not trying to earn money on that one. Um, as I said, we would really love to build our brand with this and to safeguard sharing as such, because that is what we want to do and that is what we are. Um, if we, at a later stage, going to revisit what we do, um, most likely yes. Are we going to open it up? I have no idea. Um, today we start out. We are set out to, again, try to map the global navigational skill of mankind on a normal basis. Is that somehow a summary, um, Michael, that you, you would adhere to as well? This is what we try to start out with. And um, I, I cannot tell you now whether, I don't know, in one or two or three years from now, we're going to open it up. Um, it's just not yet clear. OK, so at the beginning, yeah. Could we just have the microphone? Just to, just to comment on that, so all the data will be freely available. All the raw data we will make freely available to anybody who wants to use it. It won't be, from the university's point of view and from the scientist's point of view, it's freely available. But to openly develop it's a problem. The cognitive uh, kind of things, they, there are a lot, a lot of apps and a lot of um, <coughs> which are looking at translating just psychology experiments from the university to the, the general public. We moved away from this because we realized it's very boring for people to do. Instead, we wanted to gamify the whole thing. And this is what we're really trying to do with this, to make it exciting and still scientifically valid. So not that you just do a psychology experiment on, online. Instead, you're playing a game. And at the same time, you contribute to science. OK, I think I've got time for a couple more. Are there any more questions? Sorry, yes, please. I'm, I'm sorry I can barely um, speak. I um, got, got one question. Okay. How much is your budget? The budget? Well, um, we don't usually talk about numbers, but to give you an indication, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a budget that is reaching into the millions, and um, it is uh, below 10 million. That, that much is clear, but it is also uh, a decent chunk of money. Yeah, I hope this is uh, giving you the indication that uh, we as Deutsche Telekom are really serious about the matter. Yeah, we want to make this a success and uh, that is why we are contributing substantial amounts of budget to it. A decent chunk, there you go. Below 10 million, but millions. Uh, yes, there's a hand, I want to make sure I can see people over there. Please say who you are, thank you. Um, I'm Christoph Reichert and I have a question about have you thought about going to um, the online publisher, the online game? I think navigating through a maze is just what, what a lot of online players are doing all the day. So why a special app and not using that data? Hello. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they, uh, Hugo Spears uh, and Michael have used other games in the past and tried to adapt them for scientific use. Um, if you're talking these about are the, the scientists, we should yeah, say, working on this. Th these are the scientists who are working on Sea Hero Quest. Um, and there are limitations. And, and if you're talking from the, the game perspective itself, the reason that we had to create uh, something from scratch is because we needed to be in control of every element um, of what was on screen. And the, uh, the science data that, and how that's collected is completely custom. Um, especially because we're operating on um, mobile phones, so it has to run over a cell connection, like uh, a data connection, and transfer very, very little data. Um, so from that perspective, that's the reason why the custom game existed. If you're talking about the audience, in terms of all, there's a huge audience playing Call of Duty, there's a whole, they can download the game on their phones. That's no issue. 
Uh, so um, I think that should answer the question. Do you want question, to add quickly? Maybe, maybe the question was, uh, can I took, uh, take a regular game, Angry Birds, which uh, many people before dementia are playing? <coughs> Uh, can, can you use just, just these data and by accident you'll find some, something yeah. relevant and then you, had, you don't have the problem of participation because the, uh, the, the game is already established. It's, it's, uh, this is a valid thought, I think. It's a very... A valid thought. Valid or thought. An idea. So, so, but, but of, co of course, if you, if, you, if you scientifically design the rules of the game, the, the science is easier, and ge getting the data from established games, then, then science is maybe bad, but the particip particip participation is easy. So it, Just it, on it, that point, it's hard to decide. Let me bring Sarah in. What about reverse engineering science into popular games to do good? Yeah, we're seeing a little bit of that in the, in the learning space. And so um, educators realizing that students are learning through games, um, through sort of popular games. Um, one example is, how many of you play Assassin's Creed or know Assassin's Creed, a Ubisoft game? Don't be a shy. A couple of, of hands. <laughs> there proud, we go. Be proud. <laughs> um, and so Assassin's Creed um, is based on some uh, different war, so World War II history and Revolutionary War history. And educators were seeing that their students were acing their history tests and started to ask them you know, what they're doing in their spare time because they weren't doing their homework. And, uh, and they were playing a lot of this video game. And so, um, so this company, Ubisoft, um, a French and uh, Canadian company, has been doing a lot of research around how to integrate assessment and evaluation tools into their game to understand, um, to kind of build build that in. And so, um, so in the education space, that's really happening. And I think we'll, we'll probably start to see a little bit more of that in terms of scientific research. But I think it always does come down to um, how powerful the assessment tools can be, and um, and data privacy is always okay. an issue too. Well, so. the barrier. Well, I sadly I have to leave it there for the moment. But please go and play the game. We know we need to get the numbers up. The hashtag's there in front of you, Game for Good. Uh, go and download it and find out more at seaheroquest.com. Thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. Thank you for having us and thank you to the panel. <laughs>